This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. My name is Mike Beal, and I serve as the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Society. It's been my honor to serve on the board for going on five years. I would like at this time to call the meeting to order. And may I uh, have a motion to approve the minutes, meeting minutes of last year's annual meeting on October 21st, 2023. There's a second. Any discussion? They look good to me too. Okay. So all in favor, aye. We got that done. Uh, well, thank you all for coming, and at this time, I would like to hand the meeting over to our president, Dr. Udo Wardenberg. All right. Well, excellent. Um, so welcome to you all, and it's wonderful to have so many of you here. Um, so I'm speaking as the outgoing president now, and um, in this rare, this is the rare few two weeks where I'm also the executive director since 1st of October anymore, and um, taking up this position again. I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about our outgoing executive director, uh, Gilles Bronzebourg, who resigned from this uh, position in September to focus on research and writing. And uh, for this next year, he has taken up a prestigious membership at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, where he will be writing a book on the Roman economy. And I'd like to say for the last few years, um, he's run our society through some rather challenging times um, with COVID and everything else. And, when he took over, COVID started almost immediately. That was extremely difficult. And as you will see from our various reports, um, things are going well. He's done a fabulous job. And on behalf uh, of the board, I'd like to extend our warmest wishes and sincere thanks for his service to the society and wish him all the best. So this meeting here today will be an, a little bit shorter than usual, um, down to one hour, as we're honoring following this meeting um, with the Huntington Award, um, William E. Metcalf needs no introduction, the former curator of coins and medals at the Yale Art Gallery and the former, of course, chief curator at the ANS. Well, many uh, congratulations also for my end, and I hope that all of you will stay uh, for this event that follows this meeting um, at 4.30. So what happened um, over this last year? You're going to hear these reports. And um, I'd like to say um, from the trustees point of view, it was a very good 12 months financially. This is thanks to the donations from our members and friends, which have been very strong. Um, our investments has also done extremely well. Um, what has been, though, particularly moving, and this is one of the reasons we did very well this year, is that we had two bequests of $200,000 each, one from our former trustee, Jerry Backrock, I mentioned this last year. But then during this year, we also lost another member, Terence Cheeseman, a very loyal man, a member from Canada, who to our I have to say, very considerable, big surprise, I think, to many, um, left uh, a significant chunk of money. Um, the first 200,000 arrived this year as well. So he had come often to our society here to do research, um, and one would account him at occasional coin shows. And I, I would just say that his generosity will not be forgotten. In fact, there was such a thing as pictures of these people that I'm mentioning. Um, do I have to do this myself? Yep, here. So this was, um, as some of you might remember, uh, Terry on the left. The other members, the more prominent, we lost actually quite a large number of members this year. Normally, um, something about the ANS is that um, it always stays the same members. Um, 
although we all were, seem to be getting older. Um, this year we lost um, 24, but one of them was also Peter Donovan that maybe some of you remember in this room. Um, Peter passed away in um, 2023. He was trained originally as a geologist, but had then come in his retirement here to the ANS and worked as curatorial associate, particularly in Islamic and other sections. And without his very significant input and research in the catalog of Kushan, Kushano Sasanian Kidarite coins uh, from the American Numismatic Society, which was um, originally authored just by David Youngwood and Joe Cripp. Um, this would have not been completed and his name was added to the title, a major achievement, and we're very sorry that he isn't with us anymore, as well as um, David, David Redden, um, without his input, um, for example, we would have never had the 1933 double eagle for a long 10 years on loan at the Federal Reserve Bank, who was um, also died. Nope. Next slide. So I just like to take a moment here, please read. I won't read them all of all the other members that we have lost um, over the last year and ask for a short moment of silence. Thank you. So let me now turn uh, for a moment about the issue that is um, undoubtedly the main sort of problem that we discussed, in fact, at our board meeting this moment, uh, this morning, and this is the future location of the ANS, which is a topic that we seem to be discussing for the last uh, over 10 years. And if you ask me in, in May or so of this year, we felt rather confident that we would had actually made some progress. And as some of you know, the ANS had discussed with several universities about a possible collaboration. It was initially University of Chicago that um, fell through once there was a change of leadership and the University of Michigan then came through with a small piece of land. We developed a whole project with our architect, uh, Sam White and his team, we developed a plan the discussions with the university administrations are ongoing, but I would mislead you if I were to say they look promising. Um, this is perhaps even an understatement. Uh, a similar situation presents itself with similar discussions at the University of Pennsylvania, where we were offered um, part of a um, building um, on campus. And I'm afraid that our previous experience with Chicago, it turns out was not a one-off situation. While we now encounter this very significant enthusiasm from our colleagues, academic colleagues, about an association um, with the ANS in whatever shape, once it gets to the level of administration and in particular lawyers, um, these have rather unrealistic ideas about what they call a collaboration, which is usually rather one-sided. So while we're undertaking often major expenses in these explorations in Ann Arbor and Philadelphia or the previously in Chicago, we have also continued to continuously explore options in New York City. And if these discussions with universities have been frustrating, the New York real estate options have been simply unaffordable. Um, this is despite what you read in the newspaper, how this market in New York has virtually crashed and anyone with a little bit of um, common sense can pick up bargains. Um, it's not quite as simple and this has often a lot to do that we as a uh, non-for-profit do not want to pay tax, so we need to look at certain types of building that in particular, just like this building, have um, really the right floor load to accommodate what is our main holdings, which is the vault and the library. So despite here the significant prices, uh, having a drop in prices, which is definitely the case, ANAS can simply at the moment not afford a space uh, here in New York. 
We have therefore begun to explore a slightly different approach here by looking at cities where someone might actually want us. And we're looking generally at places that are in the vicinity of a major international airport and a university, but not looking again at um, direct collaboration. So keeping uh, the ANS independent while reaching also out uh, to a broader public, perhaps, so that it isn't just academics uh, and the more serious collectors that sustain um, this organization for the future. This debate is ongoing, but we feel at some point we need to make a decision, although it hasn't quite come yet. Um, what we learned over the last decades in these long discussions has been actually extremely helpful. I mean, they weren't just in vain and for nothing, we we also learned there is no such thing as an ideal place. You know, there's a certain part of America or it's New York City or it's a type of building. And we have to basically live with a certain amount of change um, and deal with it as our predecessors did in the past. And here I'm always reminded how bizarre it must have been when Archer Huntington decided that Audubon Towers, which was farmland, was the right place um, for this whole museum complex, which, which worked for a great number of years, um, and then it didn't anymore. And maybe that is a lesson here. So in closing, um, I want to thank uh, the trustees. There's quite a lot here present today, the staff in particular, um, but also the members and volunteers here of the ANS. There's so many people always involved with us. Um, for all they do, the ANS wouldn't really be, and this is why it is really rather an enjoyable place. And if anyone feels they want to get more involved for whatever reason, um, we're always looking for, you know, ideas, projects, people, um, you know where we all are. And I know many of you um, are already involved and I hope you enjoy the presentations um, that are going to come now. Thank you. I am Kenneth Edlow, the treasurer of the ANS, in case you don't know me. Uh, I'm going to speak a, just a, for a brief moment about uh, the financial situation for the year that ended September 30th, 2024. According to our financial statements, the, uh, in terms of gifts, we received uh, $1.2 million in total, including the two that in particular that Uda just mentioned, $200,000 each from Jerry Backwack, a former trustee and a loyal friend of the ANS for years, and Terence Cheeseman, whose picture was up on the screen. The operating budget deficit came in, in the, for the year at minus $200,000, which we don't consider awful or con of particular concern. Um, on the other hand, the portfolio, our investments increased in value by 8.2 million during the year. And at the end of the fiscal year, September 30th, our endowment stood at $51.1 million versus 48.4 million exactly one year earlier. The reason that's smaller than 8 million is because we drew it down. Oh, oh, right, the difference, you'll say, well, why didn't we go from four, why did we only go from 48 to 54? Because we took two, two and a half million dollars in effect of the appreciation and we, it got reduced because we had to pay operating expenses of, and we drew out about $250,000 a month to pay the overhead. If there are no questions, we'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. A full house. Good afternoon. I am Mary Lannan, chair of the ANS Nominating and Governance Committee. The Nominating and Governance Committee report was mailed by post to the Fellows of the Society, which is our voting membership, in August, and was posted as well on the ANS website in July. Copies of it are available for the Fellows in attendance. 
Fellows of the Society represent a maximum of 225, including Life Fellows and Honorary Life Fellows of the overall membership of the Society. As of this afternoon, we have 217 Fellows. I am pleased to report that pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of the Bylaws, three Associate Members were elected as Fellows of the Society and Fellow at this morning's regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. They are Dr. Andrew M. Burnett, James e. Dr. James E. McClellan III, and Dr. Roberta Stewart. Congratulations to you all. We look forward to your continued participation and its support as Fellows of the Society. We will now proceed with the business of the election of the trustees. Fellows of the Society are entitled to vote at this meeting. As per Article 4, Section 6 of the Bylaws, 20 fellows present in person or by proxy shall constitute a quorum. All fellows present were asked to sign in. If those fellows present have not signed in, please sign in now with Rebecca Cohen Rager, Assistant Director of Administration. And if by chance anyone is holding proxies, please present them now also to Rebecca. So Peter, you look like you're, okay. Peter is not a fellow of the society and he's, in, he's entitled to count the proxies. 74 proxies. 74 proxies. <clears throat> okay, so uh, these are the following candidates for the three-year term ending in 2027. David Albert, Lawrence Brown, Kenneth Edlow, Sebastian Heath, Jonathan Kagan, Noel Lenski, and Dr. Howard Minners. Would a fellow second denominations? Okay, thank you. Will those fellows present who have not mailed in or handed in their proxy earlier, please raise their hands in approval of these nominations? Rebecca, can you count the raised hands? Can you keep them up? Thank you. So we have a total of 87. All right. So we have everything totaled. Thank you very much. The trustees have been elected. Congratulations to the entire trustee class of 2027 and, and to Andrew for also being a fellow. I look forward to working with you and the entire board of trustees. Thank you. Am I able to advance the slides here? Looks like I'm not. Okay. So I guess I'll just, can you put up the first slide, Ben? All right. So good afternoon. It has been another exciting year here at the American Numismatic Society. Our membership remains very strong with over 1400 active members from all 50 states and from 50 nations. And we also welcomed 112 new and reinstated members over the last year. We raised approximately $1.2 million from 222 donors and through robust giving during the annual gala and our annual appeals. Every gift, large and small, goes a long way to helping us realize our mission in the advancement of numismatic knowledge and service to our members and we are truly grateful for your ongoing support and commitment. And we would like to thank each and every one of you for being here and for supporting the ANS in all that you do. Uh, next slide, please. The annual gala in January was a success, raising over $220,000. Mark Zaltzberg was presented with the 2024 Trustees Award, which celebrated his exceptional service to the numismatic community and expertise as a leader of the collectibles industry, having served as chairman of the certified collectibles group for more than 35 years before his retirement in June of 2023. The next slide, please. We received two remarkable bequests, as you've already heard, from longtime members and friends of the society. 
Professor Jerry Bacharach, a distinguished numismatist and sorely missed member of our Board of Trustees, who passed away last year and generous, generously left $200,000 to the ANS in his will. Terence Cheeseman, a friend of the ANS with whom staff enjoyed conversing at coin shows, sadly passed away this year and surprised us with a bequest of a portion of the proceeds from the sale of his estate and his collection of high quality coins. We mourn the loss of a total of 24 members who passed away this last year who are also memorialized in the annual report. And if you didn't get a copy of the annual report on the way in, please uh, take one on the way out. Uh, next slide, please. Members who donate $2,500 or more annually are admitted to the ANS's Augustus B. Sage Society and represent some of our, our most dedicated members and generous donors. Sage Society members are invited to participate in special events throughout the year. This year, Sage Society members toured the Medieval Money, Merchants, and Morality exhibit at the Morgan Library and Museum, where many ANS objects were on loan and which also benefited from the substantial input of our very own David Jung. Later, SAGE members toured the Africa and Byzantium exhibit at the Met and got to handle rare and unique numismatic objects at the New York Historical Society. The SAGE Society recently returned from a week-long tour of the Netherlands, which featured tours of some of the nation's most important cultural venues and exclusive access to some of the country's most important numismatic collections. Next slide, please. One of our most appreciated and popular member benefits is the weekly long table lecture and conversation series on Fridays. In the last year, over 2,500 participants logged in for these as attendance per long table ranged between 40 and 80 people with an average attendance of 55. This past September, we surpassed our 200th installment of this ongoing series. And the next slide, please. It is a great pleasure to meet and speak with our members at coin shows across the country and conferences across the world. This last year, we had the privilege of seeing you all at shows in Scottsdale, Baltimore, at the New York International, and in Chicago at the ANA convention. While we are fortunate to have technologies to engage with you all online, there is no substitute for this more personal engagement and we are currently developing plans to offer more in-person events at the ANS and to travel to various parts of the country where concentrations of our members live. We encourage you to check in and learn more about this as plans develop over the next several months. Next slide, please. A number of events took place at the ANS over the last year. Our chief curator will discuss educational programming such as the Graduate Seminar Seminar and the Lyceum, but I wish to note some other highlights. Last October, we presented Hannah Jelonek, a Pol Polish medallic artist with the J. Sanford Saltis Award for signal achievement in the art of the metal, which was followed by Alan Stahl's Stephen K. Scher lecture on the Histoire Metallique of Louis XIV. Next slide, please. In June, Ruth Pliego, a distinguished specialist in Visigothic coinage received the 2023 Archer M. Huntington Award for Excellence in Numismatic Scholarship. This evening, following the annual meeting, William E. Metcalf will receive the 2024 Huntington Award. And I would like to take this opportunity to offer my own cat congratulations to my friend Bill. And we all hope, we hope all of you here will be able to stay and join us to celebrate uh, Bill's achievements after the annual meeting. Next slide, please. In 2023, we began awarding ANS Chairman's Fellowships to support the work of scholars engaging in serious numismatic research. We are grateful to have continuing support to make these funds available. And over the last fiscal year, we awarded three additional competitive fellowships to support work on decorated Roman ceramic banks by Robin LeBlanc, a study of Egyptian silver ingots and imitations by Umit Ozturk, and a chronological uh, study of Lycian coinage by Helmut Lutz. Next slide, please. In the last fiscal year, I absorbed the direct management of the ANS publications program. In that time, we have focused on efficiency, both in terms of improving the production process from submission to publication 
and in terms of fiscal responsibility and sustainability. To that end, we have, for example, identified new mailing partners to reduce costs associated with the distribution of our periodicals internationally, and we actively fundraise for new book projects. Three new books were published in the last fiscal year, and I have them on the screen here. Elena Stolyark, who is here with us this evening, uh, Scythians and the Greeks on the Western Black Sea, published also jointly with uh, John Kleberg, um, our curator, Lucia Carbone, Local Coinages in a Roman World, the catalog of the Richard B. Wachonki collection, and then Anna Blomley, the Bronze Coins of Eastern Mount Asa um, in the Thessaly and Periochic region of Magnesia. Next slide, please. Over the next year, you see we have a lot to do. Over the next year, we expect to publish five new titles, uh, including the highly anticipated uh, Coins of the Ptolemaic Empire, Part Two. Uh, next slide, please. ANS Publications received four Numismatic Literary Guild Awards in the 2024 Writers Competition, which includes the ANS Magazine having been named the best club or not for profit periodical. And here I want to, of course, acknowledge, thank, and recognize our chief curator who serves as editor for that publication, Peter Van Alphen. Next slide, please. I wish to thank all of our volunteers and staff involved in making the ANS stand out among publishers of serious numismatic research. My co-editor for AJN, David Yoon, has done a tremendous job with the journal for a number of years, and I wish to thank him for all of his uh, work. He is stepping down after the publication of the 2024 issue to focus on other tasks, and Oliver Hoover has kindly agreed to take over the medieval and modern section of the journal. Peter Von Alphen continues to do a phenomenal job with the award-winning ANS magazine, which miraculously always comes together on time every quarter. And he has recently been working with membership and administration to include more member news and content, which I'm sure you will all enjoy. Christopher McDowell does a remarkable job with the Journal of Early American Numismatics and ensures that high quality content is regularly delivered to our readership interested in colonial currency. We are so very grateful for his exceptional service. Lucia Carbone and Alice Sharpless are efficient managers of the Pocket Change blog, delivering electronic content to our members. And Emma Pratt does a great job with our monthly e-news informing members of everything happening at the ANS. Next slide, please. I want to close by summarizing some notable staff developments. In December, David Yoon was promoted from associate curator to curator, so he is now the Mark Sultan Curator of Medieval Renaissance and Early European Numismatics. Rebecca Coben Rager was promoted in January from Museum Administrator uh, to Assistant Director of Administration, and our long-standing st curatorial assistant, Adia Betty, has recently been promoted to Collections Manager and is excelling in that position. Next slide, please. Of course, the biggest staff news at the ANS is that Gilles Brandsburg has stepped down from his role as executive director to pursue a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and that Uta Wartenberg is reprising her role as executive director after the lead, leading the board of trustees for several years as president. I wish to thank Gilles for his years of service to the organization and membership, and we all wish him well on his fellowship. I very much look forward to working more closely with Uta, who has a deep knowledge and institutional history of the society, having successfully guided the ANS through two previous moves, and who has been instrumental into the, in, in building the society into what it has become. Each and every one of our staff, uh, next slide please. Each and every one of our staff works tire tirelessly in the pursuit of the society's mission and service to our membership. I look forward every day to working with this great team of people. And so I will end by saying thank you to each and every one of our staff for everything that you do. If anyone would like more details on the topics I've covered this afternoon, again, I want to invite you to, and I've lost my annual report, but it's here somewhere. I want, oh, here it is. Uh, I want to refer you to this, the annual report, pick it up on the way out if you haven't already. And of course, we'll be posting on that, on that online soon as well. 
Uh, I think we can take uh, questions for a minute or two. Uh, and if not, are there any questions? Okay, and then I'll welcome uh, David Hill, our librarian archivist up, so thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Nathan. All right, slide please. Okay, I want to start by highlighting some uh, interesting items that we added to the library this year, and um, all of them are on display out there in the rare book room. Uh, some of them are unique and archival, and they include this 19th century scrapbook donated by ANS fellow David Fanning that was compiled by Alfred Sandham of the Montreal Numismatic Society, which, like the ANS, was one of the first in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, slide, please. James Anderson donated the 19th, 18th and 19th century notebooks. That he, uh, filled with handwritten notes, mostly in French, uh, on the history and geography and rulers and language and coins of China and Japan. Slide, please. And from ANS fellow William Byrd, we received a set of letters and coin envelopes from J. Douglas Ferguson, who's been referred to as the Dean of Canadian Numismatics. And in these, he reminisces about his early years in coin collecting and discusses the buying and selling of coins and tokens. A slide. From Mrs. Alexander Keish, we received various pamphlets and articles and annotated books and original photographs to add to our existing papers of Professor, Professor Guido Keish, a collector and scholar of metals, tokens, and coins relating to law and the legal profession. Slide. Slide, please. Slide. Okay, thank you. At auction, we acquired a large group of 19th century letters sent to foundational Canadian numismatist Robert Wallach McLaughlin. Some of them, uh, which came from a notable pioneer in Mexican numismatics. Slide, please. Also acquired at auction was this early invitation to an ANS meeting sent to George Perrine and signed by Joseph Levick, two important early members that were instrumental in the society's revival after the Civil War. And it mentions coins purchased at the legendary Joseph Mickley sale, which had just taken place. Slide, please. Another auction purchase was this book but, uh, with an embedded medal of um, Ulysses S. Grant a nice companion to the ANS's Grant Ceremony Scrapbook, uh, which is a 19th century item, which also has an embedded medal. Slide, please. Of course, there is our regular steady influx of books, magazines, and auction catalogs that require never-ending cataloging and processing, with Whitman Publishing being just one of the donors that I'd like to highlight here. Slide, please. Okay, yeah. So this year we added nearly 6,000 records to our library catalog. Uh, Jared just sits back there and catalogs away every day, uh, all day. Um, and so this is Jared Goldfarb, uh, our assistant librarian and the, our main cataloger. Slide, please. Uh, but most of the records we added for, we added, what did I say, 6,000 uh, records this year, which was quite a number. Uh, most of them came from our ongoing collaboration with the Newman Numismatic Portal. Uh, Laura, Jake, Laura Jacobs, seen here with Matthew Rutley, who is demonstrating a program that he set up to uh, search catalogs in the Newman Portal. Uh, Laura continues to scan the many pages of our early correspondence to place online. Slide, please. Uh, and so those scans are now directly available uh, through thousands of records. Um, I would mention that the Internet Archive, as many of you know, are having a little bit of trouble this week and it cannot be reached, uh, but we're hoping that it comes online next week. Uh, this is what we're hoping. And I'd like to mention Nicole Fry, uh, slide please, uh, also of the Newman Portal, who comes in to scan when there's oversized items to do. And slide, yeah. 
Uh, others getting work done in the library include longtime time volunteer Harriet Williams, who has completed the processing of the Mark Sultan papers and the New York Numismatic Club records and is now working on our Newell papers. Katie Jane French, a Long Island University library student uh, studying archives and records management. And Zachary Doe from Queens College, who has stayed on now to earn college credit. Uh, cataloging our archival collections, carrying on the work begun by an intern last year. So we got a lot done last summer in the archives with this intern, and now we have Zachary here to carry on the work. Uh, the summer seminar is always a great time as we welcome a fresh group of students. And it was an especially great when one of them brought in one of our youngest visitors, maybe not the youngest even, but one of our youngest visitors whose name I can't remember and I emailed her to get it, but I never heard back. So. Okay, Lorenzo Moretti of San Marino, representing one of the many auction houses to send us catalogs, came in with his wife and son, Walter. And other users include numismatic podcast interview interviewer, Greg Benick, Chris Baycraft and Andrew McCabe, searching, researching Roman Republican coins in our photo file. And Sandra Litvayeti, I know I was going to have trouble with this name, so I'm not even going to try it, um, who's working on a documentary on Victor David Brenner. In an effort to plan for the future and keep up with the best library practices, we have visited several special collections libraries, including Columbia University's Rare Book Room and Archives, also Avery Architectural Archives. And we also toured Midtown's Horological Library, which is devoted to watches and clocks. Oh, this is not the right slide for that. Was it before? No, okay, must be, I must have it that out of order. Okay, there's the Horological Society, uh, led there by a former intern here, St. John Car uh, Sitchin, it's actually the pronunciation, which I always get wrong. Uh, Sitchin um, now works there and he was a former intern here. And Scholastic, um, the other tour was at the Met, so I think we saw that slide. Kenneth Soner showed us around. Um, okay, Scholastic. The staff of one special library, the Children's Book Publishers Scholastic, Inc., uh, actually came here for a couple of tours because they see our library as a potential model for their own uh, renovations. And of course, it was my great pleasure to research and write about the society's history for our magazine, including articles on the society's early correspondence uh, and on photography medals in the ANS collection. And I was very particularly pleased to finally find a photograph of one of my predecessors, ANS librarian and amateur photographer, Richard Ho Lawrence. And also the ANS's experiences with two world's fairs at the end of the 19th century. I would like to thank everybody that's contributed to the library this year and to the archives. Um, we have two slides to thank, it was a banner year. And now I'd like to hand it over to our chief curator, Dr. Peter Van Alphen. Thank you, David. Try not to trip over the cords. Uh, slide, please. Oh, even better. All right. All right. So the curatorial department, as you might expect, spends a great deal of time on the collection. This year, much of our efforts were spent on reorganizing the Greek and metals to, uh, sections to eliminate some long-standing issues and to integrate some substantial numbers of new additions. Uh, we also had a major um, uh, registration push by curatorial assistant Ryan Sullivan, among others. And I also want to here acknowledge Jared Goldfarb's um, assistance with a lot of these projects. He was spending one day a week uh, this last year over the curatorial department and was tremendously useful um, in his time over there. Um, at the same time, we pushed hard on fixing problems with our online collections catalog Mantis as part of a change in back-end platforms used for the database. 
And as we transfer the data from one platform to another, we took the opportunity to clean up the data. And a lot of this work was in fact done by Ethan Gruber, our director of information technology with of course input from the curators. Users will immediately notice uh, when you're using Mantis, how much better the terminology is in the search facets. And these are on the left-hand side when you're in browse mode there making, we hope, what uh, you're looking for that much easier to find. Yeah, that slide advance didn't work. Let's try it again. There we go. Users will also notice a great deal more standardization on the pages for collection items themselves, as well as enhanced mapping and image features. Controlling and standardizing the terminology on our catalog pages, a hugely important task for any digital catalog, is made possible in part through the online numismatic thesaurus numisma.org. And the little arrows that you see here, and here next to some of these terms are in fact links to numisma.org. And if you click on those little arrows, it will take you to the relevant Nomizuma uh, page, such as this one, that defines and controls Tetradram. So those terms then are controlled and essentially standardized through Nomizuma.org. And this, in fact, was something that was established at the ANS nearly 15 years ago and is still hosted by the society. It has, in the meantime, grown into a large international collaborative project, and several, several of us on the curatorial staff, myself, Ethan Gruber, Jesse Kraft, and David Yoon, um, sit on various Nomisma committees working to establish controlled terminology for all of numismatics, which, again, will greatly benefit our own online catalog as this continues. Aside from our online collections catalogs over the course of this last year, we also took part in the development and enhancement of other digital resources, including the soon to be launched Levantine Coins Online. And this is a, a joint project between ourselves and some Israeli colleagues um, that has been funded by a grant from the Israel Science Foundation. And this a uh, digital resource will um, initially be focusing on the coinages of Judah, Philistia, and Samaria. We hope to have an official press release and announcement in the next week or two, so stay tuned. Um, at the same time, we also uh, made a lot of progress um, on the Roman Republican Die Project, and this is under the direction of Lucia Carbone and Alice Sharpless, and this has been funded by the Arete Foundation. After 22 years of directing the Summer Seminar, I, which is our flagship educational program, um, this is, of course, the Eric P. Newman Summer Graduate Seminar, I turned the reins over to Lucia Carboni, who did a marvelous job welcoming nine students and our visiting scholar, Dr. Ruth Pliego, um, who, as we heard earlier, won the 2023 um, Huntington Award. Um, uh, welcome them all to what we um, affectionately call the Numismatic Boot Camp. This is a June, July, eight week program that has been going on since 1952, more or less um, continuously. Um, Alan Roche, of course, uh, every year has taken the opportunity to create a highly creative class photo. And this year's photo, as you can see on the left, had Hong Kong noir as the theme. So congratulations again to Alan for that. And also I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, the other lecturers in the seminar, aside from the curators. Uh, we have a number of guest lecturers who have um, volunteered year after year uh, to give lectures, including Paul Kaiser, for example, who is here with us in the room today. So I would very much like to thank our guest lecturers um, in the seminar. While our online educational series, ANS Lyceum, uh, which typically features this wonderful um, advertising art by uh, Emma Pratt. Um, this year included a course on coinage and civil wars across the century, which also included a number of guest lecturers from um, across the globe. 
Now, at the same time that um, many of these guest lectures were participating in our Lyceum, we um, here on staff were also lecturers in other courses taught around the world, including in Turkey and China, as well as here in the States at the um, ANA in Colorado and even closer to home here in New York City. Our time on the road also included presentations of our current research in various conferences in Europe and in the Americas. And to get to one recent conference, Jesse Kraft took some vacation days to ride a bicycle 600 miles from Copenhagen to Stockholm, suitcase strapped to the back of the bike, a feat as remarkable as the paper he delivered shortly after he arrived. Um, research for some this year also included time in the field. Alice Sharpless participated in archaeological excavations in Italy. And also in Italy, David Yoon again served as co-director of a project there. And for those who are interested, most of our published research is freely available on our pages on either academia.edu or researchgate.net. So please check that out if you'd like. For several of us, our contributions to the field of numismatics also includes public service on a number of important committees and councils, both here in the US and overseas, including the INC, ECOMON, and the CCAC. And before wrapping up here, I also want to take a moment to thank this year's volunteers and interns, including Beatrice Klieger, who returned this summer to help with a cataloging project. Um, Eric Kraus and Scott Miller have been longtime volunteers and, as always, have been uh, very helpful for various projects. And now for something a little different. Um, at this point, I would typically ask our collections manager, Adia Bedi, to come up to the podium and to present this year's new acquisitions and some discussions, but we decided to try something different with the help of our ANS production team, Ben Hibner and Alan Roche. So gentlemen, if you would, please. Welcome to the 167th annual meeting of the American Numismatic Society. We here are the curatorial staff and we would like to thank our donors and our members for their generosity. We have received about almost 2,000 objects in donations this year, and they range from medals and uh, exchange valuables, paper currency, tokens. Um, it's a great, great, uh, great group of objects, and you have kept us busy this last year. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Um, each one of our curators here wants to highlight a specific object from their department. And I think we will start with Jesse, Dr. Thank Kraft. Thank you, Adia. We actually had a very significant uh, donation um, this year of a 1792 Birch cent. Uh, mm -hmm. It was created in that year. Uh, it's amongst the first coins struck for the United States. It fills a very significant hole in the ANS collection, especially for the 1792 patterns. Uh, it was made by uh, Bob Birch or Robert Birch, mm -hmm. um, who is a, uh, an engraver in Philadelphia in 1792. Um, it's a very beautiful example with most of its details still there. Uh, you can see it says uh, Liberty, parent of science and industry. Hmm. And you can tell that, uh, you know, the, the, the Formers of the uh, American coinage uh, were really trying to um, espouse science and mm -hmm. liberty as as being uh, integral to their mission. Um, the reverse is uh, United States of America, one cent within a wreath, uh, which is pretty standard from uh, then until the mid 19th century. So mm -hmm. we're very lucky to have this donation from Dr. Arnold Peter Weiss, and, uh, and we thank him very much. Hi, David. Uh, this ceremonial sword was donated uh, by Alan Helms. Um, these um, swords were made in the late 19th and early 20th century in uh, the Congo Basin in Central Africa. Um, they were highly valued, um, prestigious objects um, uh, used in ritual and ceremonial occasions uh, by important people. 
Peter, do you have something for Yeah. Me? So over the last several years, William Esposito, who is a society member, has donated hundreds of medals to the collection. And among those many medals he's donated are some really fantastic, uh, and in some cases, very rare objects, including uh, this medal, which is the Daniel Guggenheim Medal. This is an unawarded example. This is a medal that was um, established in 1928 by Daniel Guggenheim, who had made a fortune in mining and in the last several years of his life, uh, along with his son, Harry, who was a naval aviator in the First World War, decided to set up a foundation to promote uh, aeronautics and um, and especially research and education in aeronautics. And so this medal is for a great achievement in aeronautics. Um, it has been awarded every single year since 1929, right up to this year, 2024. Well, thank you. Um, Lucia, do you have something for us? Uh, this is a fun object uh, uh, donated by fellow uh, Rick Bellison. This is a 2019 uh, medal of the Royal Numismatic Society awarded to Dr. Sam Moorhead mm -hmm. uh, for his studies on the coinage of the Emperor Carausius. So Sam Moorhead is now retired, but used to be the national uh, finds advisor uh, for ancient coin at the portable antiquity skin for the British Museum. And um, he studied for uh, most of his academic careers, the coinage of the Emperor Carausius, who was uh, an usurper emperor who ruled uh, over Britain and Northern Gaul at the end of the third century AD. Um, here you can see on the obverse of this uh, medal, it's very nice to see, of course, the portrait uh, of okay. Samward. And then you can see here on the reverse, uh, the representation of the British Museum yes. with an equestrian statue of the Emperor Carausius himself. And here we read the RIC, Roman Imperial Coinage, because Sam Murad is the one entrusted with the updating of uh, the fifth volume of the Roman Imperial coinage uh -huh. series. Yes. So it's really, That's really, really cool. fun. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And for a great person, too. Yeah. Sam is exactly. Really and thank you, Rick Bellison, for really yeah. giving us this super nice object. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My favorite acquisition of this year is actually a purchase hmm. that the ANS made from a uh, auction house, Porter and Porter. And it is a Diminishing coin trick. <laughs> and this was used in Britain in 1950 by a very famous uh, slate of hand magician and card expert, hmm. uh, Graham Adams. Could you give us a demonstration? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good at it, but, you know, I can try. <laughs> so in front, we have the, uh, the uh, five shelling, the thick five shelling piece. And that's usually in front. Uh, and you do something like an abracadabra. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Well, guess what? It's a little <laughs> bit smaller. Oh. <laughs> you need to practice a little bit. I, practice I think, okay. later on, yeah, but yeah, still. Yeah. Well, anyway, and then, you know, it goes, <laughs> gets smaller and smaller until you have a very small, the 1P uh, coin, and then that disappears as well. That's it, I think, for our... Uh, the highlights of our acquisitions and um thank you so much for joining us um if anybody has something that they would like to donate to the american numismatic society please contact the curatorial staff thank you again thank you again well that was a success and uh, I think you'll all join me in uh, a round of applause to our staff who presented and are such a key part of what we do. As an ANS member, I'm very grateful to our staff, first of all, our trustees, our fellows, and to our donors who both give us time, objects, and money. So we're very appreciative. Um, we'll adjourn in a minute if there are no further questions or ideas.
and I would invite you to join us for refreshments to my right towards the library, but not in the library. David doesn't like that. And for you to um, stay and see the award for Dr. Metcalf and hear his presentation. So we will declare it officially adjourned and thank you so much.